Okay. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. We have Anne Bowden, Charlene Watson, and then Dr. Tom Moorcraft joining us um, to talk about the latest research and treatments for Lyme disease and for COVID long haulers. And we've been looking through the questions that everyone submitted and have kind of chosen our topics and what we want to focus on the most based on that. So I'll let you take it away, Anne. Thank you, Amy. Um, so we kind of put information together um, between ILADS and then Cassie, which was hosted by Designs for Health um, that did a infection conference, basically chronic infection conference that focused on COVID long haulers and then COVID or um, pandas pans and then Lyme disease. So we kind of gathered our information to present to you guys as far as what's next, what's new, what's working, um, what are providers doing out there. Um, and so the talks that we kind of pulled from, Bruce Patterson has been doing a lot of work in COVID long haulers, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, Richard Horowitz uh, talked about his Dapsone um, regimen and protocol, and Dr. Moorcroft has a ton of information about it, so we're going to also um, glean some information off of him. I've, I've used Dapsome in the past. It hasn't been to this degree in this dosing. Um, a couple of years ago when he presented at the beginning, um, it's a little bit different of a protocol now. Um, and then a little bit with Mark Houston in his work with COVID long collar as well. Um, so I guess, what do you want to start with, Tom? Um, I'm happy to start anywhere. I mean, it sounded like maybe hitting some of the COVID long haul stuff, stuff you guys were talking about would be a good idea. Okay, that's a great idea. Okay, I'll start real quick with Mark sure. Houston. So, um, Dr. Houston presented an interesting, not only preventative, but treatment with lisinopril. And the theory behind that, and I'm sure all of you have been hearing about. Uh, the clotting issue, the heart issue, the lung issue, you know, we're ending up with pulmonary hypertension, AFib, irregular heartbeat is what that means. Hypertension is, it, it's interesting, the people without any hypertension are becoming hypertensive post-COVID and even during COVID. And this, the studies were pretty replete with how the vascular system is affected. And the way that that was explained simply is the ACE receptors, which we have really all over our body, but more so in the vascular system and the pulmonary or our lungs is what we're talking about. Um, these little receptors, that's where the COVID comes and binds that's that spike protein binds with that ACE receptor. Well, ACE receptors are in the endothelium or what we call the lining of the vessels and can cause that to break down, to become inflamed. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? That we would end up with either cardiac arrhythmia or hypertension as the inside of those vessels uh, start to constrict and inflame. Uh, the premise of this preventative and treatment is lisinopril, which is an ACE receptor inhibitor. So we have a, a COVID spike protein on this receptor causing this damage, and lisinopril has the potential of removing it, not only removing it, but being able to protect that receptor. So in the studies that he presented, we have less people becoming ill with COVID that are already on lisinopril as an ACE inhibitor or hypertensive medication. That's why you would be on it is for hypertension or what we call high blood pressure. Uh, these folks are not getting COVID as seriously ill as maybe someone who's not. So that's an interesting premise. I do have patients on lisinopril, low dose, and we are using it both preventative because they have some uh, history that might be detrimental were they to get COVID again. 
or I've been using it in active COVID. And it seems for the few, because remember, we just went to these conferences that we're reporting on, um, but it does seem to be helpful. So in Dr. Houston's opinion, after some good documentation, he feels like lisinopril should be added to some of the other things. Of course, we use a lot of other things, you know, our vitamin D, our melatonin, and quercetin, we, and quercetin yeah, uh, glutathione, wow. So it, it's not the primary and only, but it's something we should be really considering. It makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? So we'll be repeating uh, those types of treatments until we also have some an anecdotal experience. But right now, it sounds like a good idea. And that kind of goes along with um, Bruce Patterson's work. So Bruce Patterson is a viral pathologist that has been kind of following COVID and long hauler and trying to figure out testing. And he has a really cool test. I don't know if you've used it, Tom, the Incel DX, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because we can look at cytokine pathways. And so, you know, he's also found that, oh, you know, people with Lyme disease and it becomes reactivated with COVID or, you know, latent viruses that become reactivated. So that test is pretty cool. Um, that we can get a little bit more information. Um, but what Bruce Patterson is using is Mravarock, which is an older antiviral medication that was used in um, HIV and AIDS, um, and it's highly anti-inflammatory. Um, and he's using that with a statin. And usually in functional medicine, we're like, no statins. Um, <laughs> statins are not good. Don't, please don't. <laughs> um, but when used in a really low dose and for, you know, a shorter period of time, this is not, you know, ongoing forever. This is what you're going to be on. Um, we're finding that a lot of patients um, are having pretty good success as far as the anti-inflammatory. That's what I've been seeing. I've been doing it since probably September with a handful of patients. And I'm seeing patients who, and even my Lyme patients with COVID long hauler, um, see significant decreased pain. That's probably the first thing that's reported. Um, and, you know, improve sleep, which is interesting with that. What have you been seeing, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really an interesting um, panel. And one of the things like we had chatted about before is they've got like over 36,000 people in it. I mean, this is almost like a full level, you know, drug study that's been funded by patients who are looking for help and researchers who are willing to dive in for them. And, you know, I, I agree. It's like, what's really interesting to me about the, the interpretation of these cytokine panels. And I just got asked the other day, is this the one I can do at Quest? And I'm like, no, it, they have a cytokine 13, cytokine 14 at like radiance diagnostics is not the same, you mm -hmm. know, it's not just one more cytokine or inflammatory marker. It's a, it's a completely different panel, but what's really neat for me is I've been working with like, um, you know, chronic fatigue and Lyme for so long. They're seeing that if we're in certain pathways, chronic fatigue is, you know, most likely if another inflammatory sort of cascade is happening, it's probably long haul COVID. And yet another one, if you have a post vaccine in, in induced inflammation, mm -hmm. and then, oh, by the way, there's this other one that we didn't know what it was. And now it's looking like that might be Lyme disease. So you could theoretically diagnose somebody with zero to four different things and know exactly that they're different from one test, which I think is really cool. That is cool. That's very cool. You know, yeah. and yeah. And then, all the, you know, I've been looking like, I, I love antivirals. I love, you know, not using statins, but low dose statins, like make some sense. They're immune modulatory, they're anti-inflammatory. And I think what you said, Anne, was so key is it's not a long-term thing. It's a, it's a period of time. And you know, I want to see what the data is when people actually get off and whether they relapse or not. But what we've learned is the anti-inflammatory and immune modulatory pieces are really important. So one of the things that we've seen work a lot is things like SPMs or specialized pro-resolving mediators, which are essentially what our fish oils in our body, what our EPA and DHA break down into. We get really nice immune modulation. We get really nice anti-inflammatory. And oh, by the way, there is actually evidence that in resistant avian influenza, I think it's like H4N1 or one of those weird number ones, um, it actually will go take your body from not being able to fight the virus and prevent replication to being able to fight the virus. So no one studied it in COVID, but we know that this is a simple, simple really safe supplement that 
clinically looks like it's been helpful in this population. And we use it a lot in pans and pandas, and it's often really good at bringing down some of our flares, especially the ticks that we see. So I'm like, hey, I've got my kids on fish oil, so maybe I'll just soup it up and just go to SPMs. And we've been using it um, in to prevent stuff, just like you were talking about, um, Charlene. And it's really good. And the other thing that I think about too is ivermectin, like thinking about emerging mm -hmm. information. Oh, Everybody, we've been using ivermectin forever, right? And maybe it's antiparasitic, maybe it's immune modulatory in certain patients, but there's a study where people were looking and with COVID is really interesting to me. We've all looked at things differently. And there's actually a study on ivermectin that they're like, why does it work in COVID? And one of the things they found is that it actually increases bifidobacteria in your gut. So one of those good bacteria, mm -hmm. and they think that the immune modulation that we're seeing in COVID with ivermectin may actually just be that bifidobacteria levels are growing up. And well, that's that. And there's actually paper. I should send you guys the paper, but like Jeff Thurston from Master Supplements told me about it, and then I just because. I don't care. I, I want to use what works now for patients. Mm -hmm. And I also want to make sure that we understand why it might be working because we have to do like COVID has shown us. Sometimes we have to use clinical decision-making and we have to kind of like innovate on the fly, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we should stop going back to the science because I want to know why my ivermectin works. Why does my hydroxychloroquine work? And one last thing about Bruce Patterson that blew my mind, and this is something I think we really need to, he looked deeper. And what they're saying is in their research, it looks like it's not like active COVID that's long haul COVID. Right. It's the spike protein that the fraction of it. Now, so then we go and we look at our new vaccines that are super S protein excitable. Like, like we just threw all this spike protein. Oh, it's COVID, it's COVID. Well, the piece we picked to vaccinate against COVID with is really maybe one of the things that's causing most of the problems. And that's where they think the inflammatory piece, and it's a little too early to really say, but there, it looked for sure, but it looks like long COVID and even vaccine responses, a lot of it's the S protein. So now we have to figure out what to do with that <laughs> if it pans yeah. out, right? Well, and it was interesting because Horowitz talked quite a bit about um, COVID long haul too, and he was comparing it with Lyme and differentiation and all that kind of stuff in association. Um, but one thing he talked about with ivermectin that I thought was actually really interesting is that um, ivermectin actually lowers the NF kappa beta, and NF kappa beta um, when we it activates um, B cells, right? So if we lower NF kappa beta, then and make sure that I'm saying this right. Um, the viral replication increases. And so things like, um, you know, ivermectin will actually, it's like cellular protective. It's not just, and I think that's the hardest part about saying like, oh, COVID doesn't, or ivermectin doesn't treat COVID. Well, it doesn't, right? Yeah. But, but what he, it does for the body supports it to work better, right? And I and I think that's the hardest part. And that's same with like glutathione. So if glutathione decreases within the cell, okay, now viruses can replicate. So if we give people glutathione, then viruses can't replicate. And so, you know, it's it's just looking at it different. It's just, just changing your perspective on treatment. Instead of saying this one drug treats this one thing, it's like, no, this is protective for the patient. Um, and it's protective for long haulers too, because as long as we are decreasing viral replication for long haulers, um, then there's this opportunity for, you know, the body to get better versus yeah. just an autoimmune response. Um, I think that that goes back to what you're saying about functional medicine. They're like, yeah. what is the purpose of what we do? Um, I actually was on my way home um, from the office to be able to do this with you guys. And all of a sudden on this really dark road, on the highway going 65, a deer with these huge antlers runs out in front of my car. I'm slamming on the brakes. There's people behind me. I'm swerving. And the, it's just like I, I my, my stress hormones are through the ceiling. And then somehow by some miracle, the th it wouldn't stop right. It bounced off the back of my car and I see nothing on the car. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to check what was going on with the deer. But it was like one of these things where you're just like, you know, what my, yeah. like my adrenaline is through the, the ceiling, but my adrenaline also then afterwards calmed down. Right. And I was talking with my wife at the time and I just like, you know, you have to let that calm down. But if we live in this 
stress state all the time Mm -hmm. where we feel like we're dodging the deer on the road, like every minute we're going to be suppressing our immune system because we don't need that chronic stress. And so I think it just, all of this stuff reminds me of what is our goal? I mean, and to me, our goal is to help the body support the body and its self-healing mechanism, its self-regulating mechanism. Mm -hmm. And so when there's something to be done, I do it. And then I get the hell out of the way. Like my nervous system tonight was like, holy shit, you have to go from chill, just paying attention, driving down the road, having a conversation to, oh my God, evasive reaction. What the hell just happened? I had a flashback to a friend of mine who had a really bad run in with the deer before. And then I had to let it go. Right. And that's what our, we're supposed to do as clinicians, you know, doctors and nurses and all these healthcare practitioners is it's like old school osteopaths said, find it, fix it, leave it alone. And my goal is to catalyze healing and get the hell out of the way and let the patient's body do the work. And mm-hmm. I think that's, that's what you're highlighting. And there's so many different pieces where maybe I've, you know, and we don't know if ivermectin treats COVID. We don't know if anything treats COVID for real. It's too early. There's not enough data. We're studying it as we go, but we do know what can support the body systems. And that's the part I love. Like at the beginning of COVID, we, a lot of people were talking about thymus and alpha one is really good in COVID. I'm like, thymus and alpha one is a really good peptide for improving natural killer cell function, B cell function, T cell function, immunoglobulin levels, and modulating your immune system. And when you do all that, your body naturally can fight off viruses better. That is a different statement than saying it fixes COVID. And then we couldn't have it forever because somebody went and opened their mouth and said the wrong, something that was, you know, we're, 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 there's a space there. We were, we were making a leap of faith that we hadn't studied yet. And I really like having this opportunity to sit down and talk about like a lot. We were talking earlier, like a lot of the the docs get on the stage and they have to just sell like their idea to other docs. But then we kind of jump over the, Hey, this is in five people I saw rather than in 35 or like in Patterson's work, 36,000. There's a difference. All of these are valuable, but let's have a conversation. That's like really true, you know, and honest and be like, Whoa, what's going on here? Because then you get to see, well, ivermectin might work for a million different ways. And as long as I don't make a claim, that's not true, then people don't take it away from me. <laughs> you yeah, know? Exactly. Yeah. 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 And that is what we are, we're looking for, you know, the, the test, by the way, I want to revisit that just for a minute. Um, the name of it in cell DX. Yeah. In cell DX. That's our first try at even really diagnosing well, because we have so many long-term kind of problems showing up post-COVID. Is it really COVID or is it Lyme or is it whatever? Mm -hmm. You know, now we're starting to get some data. And I think what we didn't say before between us three, we understood what we were saying, but the audience is saying, what's a cytokine? right? Mm -hmm. What is, what is this pathway of inflammation that's typical to Lyme or this pathway that's typical to COVID or this pathway and so on, right? Um, A cytokine is an inflammatory chemical the body uses everybody to try and protect us from whatever the the invader is or the problem is as the body perceives it. So there are different chemicals that are being released trying to help us. But in in a true sense, that's what makes us feel sick. So is this test important? Well, how do you feel about that, Tom? I think a history is important, but if they <laughs> wait, imagine that talk to your patient. <laughs> <laughs> I know gather information. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's a, it's a history. Um, I know that the chemicals are making them feel sick. I know it's an inflammatory response. Uh, so what do we have? I don't, you know, I liked your point where we're so new to the game that we have these little pieces of information, but they're not the end all people. They are not the end all. We are trying to find more and more little pieces that we can put together for you to help you feel better. 
Um, well, and that is the purpose of functional medicine, going back to what Tom said, you know, True. I mean, there's a reason why we look at hormones. There's a reason why we look at the gut. There's a reason why we're asking all of the questions. We're not just like, oh, you're tired, right? Oh, well, what about your sleep? And if that's all we're asking, we're missing 90% of the picture, because if we can truly put the body in an optimal state of wellness, it can fix itself. Right. There you go. And then you stand aside, Tom, mm -hmm. and let her out. <laughs> I'm telling you, like, it was so funny. I started telling the deer story and I forgot why I started telling it. And I was like, oh, my adrenals are telling me something right now. But it's like, <laughs> look, I had chronic Lyme and Babesia. I was sick for six years. And then the at that point, every doctor I went to said I was depressed or I had chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. Oh I'm like, that is the, yeah, yeah, I know. Right. My joints hurt and my brain doesn't work and everything and and like I have no energy. So thanks for telling me they put a name. This is the thing I always ask people not to label stuff mm -hmm. because what what I went into my primary after years and years of all these antidepressants and all these other weird drugs, like, do I look like a depressed person? I mean, I, I don't know anyone who's ever met me who could believe I was ever put on, a, on, a, on one of those medicines, right? Like, I'm just like Energizer Bunny, super happy. I don't go super oh, high either because yes. that would... Yeah, for all those who want to know you uh -huh. right and it's like look I, I was pissed off because every time i went to them they're like you have these pains that were now a syndrome that basically didn't tell me what was wrong or how to get better so you gave me no hope yeah. so love the diagnosis fibromyalgia my favorite chronic fatigue i mean yeah wow talk about chicken shit right that well, is not root cause analysis not even close. So what was interesting though, was one is I, I asked my patients to not tell me they're having a Lyme flare I'm at, or a COVID flare. I want you to tell me what you're experiencing in your body so that I can know what it's like to be you. So that then I heard somebody earlier today, he's like, Dr. Tom, I've been to a bunch of different docs. And he's like, you really hear me. Thank you so much for listening yeah. and understanding what I'm telling you. Yeah. And literally all I did was listen and repeat back to him what he said. And then, but I took it to heart. And so one of the things is, is for patients, don't tell us what you think is wrong. Tell us what you're feeling. We have spent our lives and in, including in my case, like our, my personal and my professional life doing this. Right. And the other part though, that's really interesting where it comes in is I always want to empower people to take care of themselves so that one, they're the world's worst viral and bacterial host. I want your, I want COVID and Lyme <laughs> to look at you and run the hell the other way. If I was a virus, I wouldn't want to live in them. Yes. <laughs> right. But when I was sick, six years into this, the doctors, I gave up on them because they had all given up on me. And I remember standing there in Port, South Portland, Maine, staring at the wall which is actually kind of funny that it happened staring at the wall because my when I first had Lyme, my boss found me staring at a wall, drooling on myself, and that's how I knew I was sick. Um, it was really bizarre. And then, so anyway, I'm looking at this wall and I go, I see my life going that way and I don't like that way. But that's the easy way my life keeps going. And I also see this darkening, but still a little bit of a light in this future. I'm recently married. I want to play out. I want a family. I want to play outside with my dogs and go skiing and mountain bike and Frisbee, all the cool things outside. And I'm like, I got two choices. This is happening and I can focus on that. Or I can say, I'm going there and I'm not going to forget about this, but I'm going to take every action now to help this so I can get there. And so I chose this, that one. And then somebody handed me a yoga DVD and this is where I think the, the most important learning is you decide what you want your life to look like because you're not going to forget about the shit show you're in today. And then you take action in that direction. And as soon as I did, somebody gave me this yoga DVD. I couldn't touch my kneecaps, literally bending forward. I had to sit down to be able to actually put my pants on. I was so fibromyalgia. -y. And I just said, I'm going to do a little bit more today than I did yesterday, whatever that means for today. And um, I learned from someone that yoga is breath on move, movement on breath, not the other, not any other thing. So if you can't breathe fully, you're doing it wrong. So I'm like, Hey, if I'm in a conversation with someone and I can't breathe fully, something's not going right. Let me take it. Let me check back in. In the moment I swerved around the deer and then he bounced off the back of my car. <laughs> like it was like, I didn't breathe for a second. Then I go, Oh wait, I'm supposed to be breathing. And so when I'm telling my story, I'm like about my illness. 
Am I telling it from a place of objectivity and love and compassion for myself so that I can heal? So my breath is deep or is my breath locked up? And ultimately the next two years, I just did yoga the best I could that day but I did it six days a week, hour and a half a day, because that's what the guru said to do. And sometimes an hour and a half a day was like, I tried to touch my kneecaps three times and then I sat there breathing. And ultimately I got to the point where my body was about 70 to 75% better in, in the course of two years. So eight years into my illness, I'm almost better. And all I did was do yoga, which told me to listen to my body, calm my nervous system and change my diet. And then when I met the doctors that I still needed, that last 30%, I was able to receive and get better. So the placebo for me wasn't 33%, it, you know, that like mind over matter piece. It was like 70% was in my category. So imagine like if you could get long haul COVID, you could get chronic Lyme, and then you can get better mostly on your own. And then you come to people like us and we look like superstars and you feel like a superstar because it just goes like this because your body's used to healing itself. And that's what I'm always trying to help people learn is I didn't get better from Lyme by taking more antibiotics and more medicines. I needed them. But the first thing I did was I looked inside and found out what I could do on my own. And with COVID, what we're learning is the more you do ahead of time, the better it is for you. Right. And yeah. that's just I, it's just so empowering in a, in a time that really hasn't seemed that way. Well, and I think the, the biggest a uh, black mark on COVID in medicine general is we were like, don't go outside. What? <laughs> don't, you know, like don't, don't interact with other people, shut off your social communications, you know, and, and as a human being, we need connection. You know, I mean, there's a reason why we always talk about, you know, it takes a village to, you know, raise kids. It really does, right? This influence. Right. And what we're seeing in the mental health with our pediatric population is detrimental. I mean, we told them they couldn't go play with their friends when, you know, growth and development is all about pulling away from family and establishing their own peer group, you know, and, and I think that we have to like change our mindset so we don't do this again too with the next whatever thing comes out. Right. Um, because I think that, you know, I mean, who didn't put on 10 to 30 pounds during COVID? And what did we say that was the highest risk for people during COVID? Obesity, right? And I mean, we, we, we created this honestly storm for people to not be well. And we told them, you know, like, sorry, there's nothing you can do besides, you know, don't go anywhere. And, and it's really sad to see that instead of us talking about diet, nutrition, exercise, yoga, breathing, how do we get out of vitamin D? Stress? Vitamin right. D, right? And also that the sun kills viruses. So the answer is go outside um, and grounding, earthing, right? All of these things that are so important to our body, um, we kind of took away. It, it was it was the most bizarre thing during COVID. Um, and that and that includes like Lyme patients. You know, we want them outside, we want them interacting with people because the worst thing that can happen is you isolate yourself, right? Because then everything becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, it's interesting that you bring it up, Anne, too, because there's a thing called polyvagal theory, right? And so um oh, that's a big good. thing we all talk about, right? And so for a lot of us, that might not be um common vernacular in the evening, but um polyvagal theory is basically saying. Most of us are familiar with the fight or flight mechanism, right? So uh, kind of what happened to me with the deer, but let's say like I'm hanging out with a saber-toothed tiger around a campfire or with my friends around the campfire, saber-toothed tiger comes, I have the choice, I can fight or flight, right? So I see the saber-toothed tiger, I go, I can win. I turn around and I fight. Or I say, I can't win that battle, but I can run away, right? And so that's what we usually think of as our sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. But the key to it is we can win. And then we think about resting and digesting and partying and sleeping and digesting our food and healing. And we call that parasympathetic. But what we've learned is that the problem is if I decide to run away from the saber toothed tiger and then he catches me, it's kind of like a cat, right? We've all seen the cat outside running around playing with the chipmunk or the mouse and grabs it. So the little thing was scurrying around. And then when the mouth, when the cat grabs it, the only thing it thinks of doing is freezing because now it can't run away and it can't win. And so it's like, I can't win and it freezes and it goes limp. Cat gets bored or the saber-toothed tiger gets bored. They drop us, we run away. 
So it's a, it's a reflexive defensive mechanism. Mm -hmm. So we, this is, a, and then, so people who've recognized that freeze is another piece of this sympathetic parasympathetic thing. That's part of the parasympathetic nervous system have called that polyvagal. So basically the gist of the whole thing is when you're frozen, your immune system function goes down. When you're frozen, your gut doesn't work. Just like when you're in fight or flight in which all those things happen. But the difference between chronic fight or flight, which is your chronic stress or this frozen state is you start to feel hopeless, withdrawn. And here's the key that's really crazy. Lyme and COVID can cause this and they, they cause you to do this. So you, you withdraw, you don't make eye contact and you basically suppress your own immune system and you get more and more and more withdrawn. Yeah. What's super crazy though is that's exactly what isolation does. Mm -hmm. So in COVID, we just said, everybody, let's do the absolute worst thing for supporting your immune system. And, and so there are certainly times to be doing that, you know, and, and isolating, but not in the way we did it. And the problem is now, this is where I find it really intriguing is how do we get out of this? Well, they talk about, you have to get into that feeling safe and gratitude in your heart and all this. And the problem is most of my Lyme patients are like, I am safe. I know that I'm safe in my house. I know that healing is safe. But every time I go to heal, my body freaks out and goes back into this frozen state again. Or they have a Herxheimer. They've made great progress for months and months and months. They're 50% better. And as soon as they recognize they're 50% better, they go backwards to 2% to better again. And so I think what the problem is, is cognitively, we look at it and we go, oh yeah, by the way, I'm safe. But in your reflex protective mechanism, you don't feel safe. And what ha if we call it familiarity, so because when you first get COVID or you first get Lyme, it's pretty unfamiliar and you don't like it. But then after a while, you don't like it and you get into, but you get into the rut of this is how my life feels. So it's your comfort zone. So that protective mechanism views that as safe. Your higher brain knows that it's not, you're not safe. You feel like crap, but that reflex protective mechanism just goes with familiarity. So now if we ask our patient to change and AKA get better, they actually, their nervous system flips out and brings them back to not being safe. Mm -hmm. So the, the problem with the word safety and polyvagal is that if you, we're talking about safety to your primitive nervous system, not to your higher mind. And so I just use the term familiarity, but it's cool because now we know how to get you out of it. And we also know that Lyme will, in your brain, make changes in areas that prevent you from recognizing the cues of safety, like facial expressions, gestures, and intonation in the voice. And so these people that we think have this illness mentality, which so many of our chronic people have, oh, it's all in your head, or you're making yourself sick, or just get over it. No, it's like real stuff. And the more they hear that, the more that just proves to your nervous system that you're not safe in that other environment. Let me pull back into the safety cubicle here of the comfort zone of suffering like mad every day, all day long. And so that's where as practitioners, we have to be really careful and compassionate and loving and also ask our patients acutely to do things that might be crazy and fast. But most of our chronic stuff needs to be done gently over time with a lot of support Absolutely. so that we don't re-trigger them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that I believe is full circle back to what Anne was saying. Uh, you know, Lyme is what it is, COVID, long haulers, whatever we're talking about, we still have to support all that other stuff. Yeah. So we know in the uh, conference we went to that this persistent, persistent low testosterone hormones dysregulated, we find that in Lyme disease, that's a common finding. How do you feel when you start getting your testosterone back up? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, there's some of that 50% you're talking about. If we can get ourselves in a better place before we have to go to you and me and Anne, 50% uh, better if you have some joy in your life. I know that, you know, uh, supporting the adrenal glands, testosterone, getting the gut in a better place, people are pretty amazed at how much better they can feel with those. I don't want to call them simple, but as 
as opposed to chronic infection, they're simple, you know, all kinds of support. So if everyone listening can talk about in their own journey, trying to get these other things on board for them so they can feel even, Tom, they need to feel motivated to be able to do it because they have this chronic withdrawal, this, this nervous yeah. system isolation mm -hmm. that you're talking about. That in itself, just to be able to um, affirm their life as I'm going to join this fight can be huge. Well, and you can oh, get better though. I mean, I think that's one of the wonders. You can get better, but that's I did it. you need to start, right? Is that that withdrawn, isolated, I feel too awful to even try. That's where we need to say you can get better. And all these little things can really help you. Let's start gently, exactly what you said, this, this big chronic thing, um, starting all at once, that's overwhelming, perksing, you know. I ask people uh, what they love to do. Yeah. And, yes. and it's like half the people tell me they, they, they're just like, well, I just spend all day researching Lyme. I'm like, no, that's my job. Yeah, agreed. Good job. That's not your job. And yeah. Well, you know, and once you have the body in a state that you can do these hard things that as practitioners, we're going to ask you to do, um, which is actually what I was going to bring up next is like Horowitz protocol, right? For Lyme, if we can get them in this spot and give them some tools and hormones balance and all these things, and then- hope. And hope, so like you keep talking, absolutely about. Yeah. that people can get better. Um, they can do these hard things because when we talk about Richard Horowitz's protocol, right? So he's using rifampin, dapsone, nystatin, plaquenil, or azithromycin, um, doxy, or minocycline, or both, um, and plus a whole slew of biofilm busters, um, probiotics, methylene blue, herbals, herbal antibiotics, um, you know, detoxing beforehand. I mean, it's a lot and it can work. I mean, Horowitz at this point has three years of data with thousands of patients um, on his protocol for eight weeks, which is impressive because I remember going, Tom, to the um, IA lads foundational and it was like 18 months of antibiotics that was a little while ago um and now we're seeing like you know with all of these modalities right where it's like mind body awareness hormone support gut balancing when we get all of these things to get together there's like this awesome opportunity to get people better faster it's, right. it's really exciting actually it is it's a whole different way to think than we used to the foundation did talk about 18 months, but then they said, don't ever tell anybody they're getting better for three years. And I thought, oh, okay. Well, yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure if we go back to all those videos, I didn't, I, I'm one of the people who just, who uses no numbers. Like I'll give people an estimate if they push me on it. But I think the thing we, we learn is like, I have no one who's been able to do Rich's protocol the way he writes it. Like, so it's not like you do the first month of Dapsone and then you're now you go from 100 milligrams to 200 milligrams and you're on double dose for eight weeks and you're good. I have every, everybody's like one to three weeks on each dose going up and some never get there. But what I think is interesting is I step back because I know Dr. Horowitz really well and a great friend, one of my main mentors is really the person who got me thinking like this. And between him and Ray Jones, the things that re they really stimulated me were to learn how to think about what we're doing. So if we step back and we look at the protocol, doxycycline and rifampin as part of the Dapsone protocol. Well, that's really nice because now I'm hitting mycoplasma and chlamydia and pneumonia. I'm hitting Lyme disease. And now with the double down with the rifampin, I'm actually hitting Bartonella. Might not be the world's strongest Bartonella protocol, but then I add in methylene blue, which is really cool because that helps me with my Bartonella persisters, especially when combined with rifampin. And oh, by the way, the Dapsone, which is my anti-leprosy drug that's supposed to be crushing the Lyme disease causes meth hemoglobinemia, which is I just, know. it's yeah. kind of like, I think for lay people, it's kind of like carbon monoxide poisoning, but not quite, but your oxygen saturations go down a lot like in COVID, but we did it with the methylene, but now methylene blue is the treatment for that. So now I'm actually minimizing some of my side effects of the main treatment that's full of side effects by knowing that I can add methylene blue in 
both for that as well as for Bartonella. So now I've got a broader coverage. And then obviously nystatin and things like that would be preventing yeast overgrowth. And Rich's whole protocols get really big. But one thing I want to remind people of is he's the person on the forefront doing the study of this. And there are people who want to be on the forefront and want to try stuff, even if they might get hurt. I have a lot of people where we use that guidance we get from Rich and we customize it for them mm -hmm. because they're not at the same place the people in the paper are. And most of my patients are not at that place. We're, we're you know, so like I talked to Ken Ligner recently um, and you know, he's the one who originally started doing a lot of the disulfiram work and a lot of people have looked at it, but in the beginning, like he and even Rich Horowitz are like, look, we need to get the 500 milligrams a day. We need to do that for 12 weeks, six to 12 weeks, and you're probably going to be cured. Well, what they found is most people can't do that. Mm -hmm. We've found that a lot of people need 25 milligrams a day for a long period of time. And some of those are more stable than anything else they've ever been on. And then I have people who are like, I talk in the can, he's like, we're finding that 25 milligrams a couple of times a week, 37 and a half milligrams a couple of times a week for some people, or even 250 milligrams here and there. But they don't think we actually need to get to that original 500 milligram dose. That's right. Lower, and right? I mean, that anecdotally too. I mean, we know we can't do that very often at all. I've never, I don't think I've ever got somebody up to what they had originally planned on. Right. So, yeah. Well, and then, you know, then there's accidents. Like Rich was telling me, you know, they're looking at quadruple dose steps. And please don't anybody try to do this because no. it, I have a few people we do it with. I do it very differently than he does because I have unique patients, but we're literally pulsing triple and quadruple dose steps. So, but the meth hemoglobinemia, even with full on all the time meth. Uh, methylene blue is obscene. I mean, I have people who like their pulse oxes are down 82 in two Ooh. to three days. So this is not something that you should just willy nilly go and do, but this particular person has a unique medical history. And this is the only thing that's actually moved the needle in over five years. So, and whenever we use other things, whether they're medications or herbals, he has some really nasty side effects that could actually like GI bleeding and stuff. And it's, it's a really unique case where he has a lot of doctors supporting this and I'm doing something different. And that's the one thing we have to remember about Rich Horowitz and Ken Ligner. Like they are doing, oh, Ken did three people. Then he did more people. Then we did a lot more people. And then Rich Horowitz is very well known for doing progressive protocols, but people go to him for that. And then I watch what happens and I apply that to the general population of patients who see me who are different. They can't do as many things as his can. So yeah. you do not need to give up your individuality in order to get better. And I'll tell you what, I mean, with me, minocycline, ceftin, fluconazole, and a little bit of ABAB, and that was for a long time, but that was the main thing. None of, you didn't hear anything fancy in there. No. Right. And mm -hmm. so that's the thing is like, I think one of the things we do is we, we, we look for these great protocols and then instead of using them for inspiration, we put them up there. Like we're supposed to all do them. And that's what I love about our conversations. I know the three of us just don't do them. We learn about them. We apply them to the people in front of us, which might mean I need to change it up a little bit. Like I've done disulfiram and fluconazole, which I'm sorry, don't do that. I wouldn't do that, but, um, and <laughs> methylene blue um, together. I've done methylene blue and clotrimazole and nothing else. I've done disulfiram and dapsone, right? So still soup liver. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. I remember you speaking um, at ILADS a couple of years ago on methylene blue and the clotrimazole. Um, and, and going mm -hmm. back to your point, Tom, which is like the biggest point is um, every patient is different, right? And we really do have to customize for every single patient. And when something's not working, they can't tolerate it. What else do we have in our toolbox? Which is why I love going to conferences because we just gather more information, have more things that we can do, more information that we can try. Um, right. to help our patients and going back to, you know, listening to their story, um, which is actually mm -hmm. the most important part because everyone lives their story just a little bit differently. And how can we help support them in their story of wellness? Right. Yeah, right. Well, you know, what's really exciting too is um, since 2000 and 
end of 2019 and probably 18 with a lot of the Dysol framework, we've had a lot of uh, advances. And, you know, the work out of that uh, Sunja Schweig and Jacob Leone did with Dr. Zhang and his lab at, at Johns Hopkins is like, there's some really cool Lyme stuff that came out of here. And it's like, when you look at the herbs that can address Lyme and Lyme persisters, and the fact that we found that cryptolepis is the only thing we've ever studied to completely eradicate Lyme disease. And when you compare it then to any single antibiotic, any double antibiotic and any triple antibiotic protocol, there's only one triple antibiotic protocol in a Petri dish that'll do it. And we can't do it in people in the United States because we don't have all the drugs. Um, and I've tried to come really close and it didn't do much of anything except cause side effects. Yet we know that cryptolepis, Japanese knotweed, Chinese skull cap, and maybe a little black walnut hull do an amazing job. Cryptolepis can potentially be one of the key players in eradicating Lyme, but we also know that it gets through the persister form. So a lot of these biofilm protocols, we actually have herbal tinctures that have been shown to break the biofilms. And a lot of the things we use for biofilms, we think do it, but we haven't proven it. And mm -hmm. things, you know, and so I really love like, and we saw a lot of the Bartonella Hensley stuff with all those herbs being great for biofilms and all the other persisters. And then we also, you know, obviously the methylene blue, the clotrimazole, even I have people like nitroferantoin. I would, I don't really use that as a systemic drug, but if I have bladder problems in a Bartonella patient, hey, we have evidence that that might be a good idea. Um, and so we can start to really think about these things that way. And then what's, was it 2017 or 18? There was that study that showed mepron and azithromycin as well as clindamycin and quinine were the two kind of major, you know, protocols for treating Babesia microti don't work on Babesia duncani. Yeah. So we know what medicines work on microti. And then in 2020, we found out that Chinese skull cap and, and um, cryptolepis um, are pretty darn good for Babesia duncani and a lot of the, the medicine, the uh, other herbs we thought were probably didn't perform as well. Now they didn't do it in combination. They didn't do it in meds and herbs combination. They weren't looking at what happens in an actual human being who is happy and a human being is miserable or a human being who eats like fast food and, and Jolly Ranchers versus someone who eats a really clean plant-based full forward diet with good proteins, you know, whatever. So we don't know what's really happening in the human body, but it gives us a guidepost. And so I've seen a lot when we start to use our herbs and understanding where they work, we can really start utilizing all this evidence. We can start to really, you know, move the needle for our patients because now not only do we know what to use, but we, but like, cause we used to just throw stuff at the wall and see what stuck because it sounded like it was an antiparasitic or an anti-malarial. But now it's interesting. Like I think about methylene blue, like it was the world's first commercially available anti-malarial. And then on the flip side of this, they studied it for Babesia microti and it doesn't work. But in my, my Bartonella Lyme people who also have a lot of air hunger, whether or not they have Babesia or not on, on blood work, methylene blue seems to help. So I'm like, is that an oxygenation thing? Or is that a, wait, not Babesia microti? Oh, but no one studied it for Duncani or Otocoilii or any of these other ones coming out. So what's the question is, are we seeing clinically that methylene blue is helping other Babesias based on the clinical presentation? Because a lot of what I've learned in the last 15 years is wait five years and the science will catch up to what we've been doing or wait 20 years and it'll catch up. But it's like this, this is what I love about the conferences and listening to like, why did Rich, I don't really care about his protocol. I, I care about why he started doing it. Like, yeah. what did he see in Dapsone that made him think it? Because now I know what Dapsone is. I know other drugs like Dapsone and I know herbs like Dapsone. And I can, that's really exciting because yeah. now we can give different people different options. Yep. Agreed. Absolutely. Agreed. So we need to wrap it up. And what we're talking about, everybody, is Dr. Moorcroft um, went to ILADS. He has wonderful experience. Um, former president of ILADS. Former yeah. president of ILADS. Time. He supported nurse practitioners. So yeah. he was always my favorite. <laughs> Just putting that out there. Yes, he made us very welcome at ILADS. Uh, highly scientific at the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was fun too. The One of the things that was really cool too is this year, um, I didn't really touch on it, but we started talking about the herbs. Is um, Mariah Hinchy did a sick, If I think you guys saw her at Cassie too. 
her herb lecture, they gave her like 20, 25 minutes to do it. The most evidence-based, clearly presented herb lecture I've ever heard in my entire life. And so it's really exciting. Did you guys see her there? Because like, yeah, I think so. Amazing. We use a lot of lime core botanicals because there's other people who make the same herbs, but her and her husband are the ones who tincture them and source them. And I know I literally know the table they started making them on before they had a manufacturing <laughs> facility. Oh, it's wow. like, but the but the thing is, Mariah gets up and talks about the evidence and why she uses certain things and why you might use it or not. And I just think it's so cool that we can all come together and have these conversations and inspire people. And, you know, I was just on a long haul, a COVID long hauler summit. And when it comes out, you should definitely check it out. But um, most of what we talked about supporting the immune system and get and, and allowing the drugs to work best is love and compassion, mostly directed towards oneself. And so I just love how the conversation is like, the hardcore science. Let's find out what's going on. Let's help people where we can with our medicine so that they don't have to suffer as much. And oh, by the way, like you said, and like, let's go back and tell them I'm not fat shaming here. I'm literally telling you there is medical evidence that being overweight and obese puts you at higher risk for COVID. Whether you like to hear that or not, I just said it because it's the facts as best we know today. And I want you to know the facts so that you can make a decision in your life that will help you get better if you so choose. You know, and it's like, it's informed consent. Why are we not telling people things? Cause we're uncomfortable about it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I think is so <laughs> wonderful about you too. It's like, we're talking and it's like, let's just be hope dealers and truth dealers. Yeah, yeah, and providing hope. It, it is, I really appreciate that. I just had a, a moment with a patient that, really is very well all of them are really close to my heart when this kind of chronic thing happens in your life you know there is some reason for it but here we are in the middle of it what are we going to do you know when we start losing hope that is that is where we don't want to be we want you here we want you in our office we want to be able to talk to you to let you know that we have not only what we've done in the past, but we have new hope. We have other ideas. We always have ideas. We're not, we're not gonna run out of good ideas to help you get better. This patient that was with me the other day and Dr. Horowitz has made a huge deal about it. And you just gave a great dissertation about our brain has got to match, you know, the way we think has got to help us um, stimulate our immune system. So wanting to get better, hopeful about getting better, believing you can get better. What path am I going to take to do that? What do I like to do? I loved that part, Tom, rather than me telling a patient what to do. What do you want to do? And what can we do 10, 15 minutes a day? So I want to leave my, my last words is we really do love our patients. We do care about you. There is always hope. Um, we do have to figure out how to get you thinking more in that pattern so your brain can help your immune system start to clear some of this polyvagal theory, um well, cortisol, trauma work, trauma work. Mm -hmm. you know it's it's amazing how even dr horowitz talked about if trauma. your patient doesn't have a good space in their head and they want to be sick or they think they do or they think that's who they are they're not going to get better yeah uh, wow okay so we've really got to convince people um, in our office that they are cared for and they can get better and think about that. Do you want to get better? So, you know, and don't we all want to get better? It doesn't matter if we have chronic illness or not. That's a human thing. Right. So we want that for you. Um, we believe in that and we are constantly looking for different ways to help support that. So and really cool research going on all the time, um, oh, yes. which is amazing. It's just exactly right. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and Tom, I love what you said, you know, 
you know, when we talk about, you know, Dr. Horowitz's protocol and his inspiration from not only him being sick, but his wife being sick, I don't think there are very many of us providers who don't know many people personally who, you know, I mean, it's the reason why we go to the conferences, right? We don't go necessarily just for us. I mean, if I didn't, you know, if I just did primary care and saw people for five, 10 minutes, um, I would not be happy, but it would be easy, right? Um, but we go because we have something to offer. Well, we hope that's true. We we want people to get better. I mean, functional medicine is all about hope and how do we get people better and how do we get this optimal state of wellness? Because we want everyone to thrive. Um, and just know there's so many options out there. You know, I tell people all the time, I'm like, I get people better of Lyme all the time. It might take a minute. It might be the first thing we try. It might be the 10th thing we try, but people can get better. It's just picking the right thing and the new right. testing that we have now. So we can, you know, differentiate between which Bartonella, which Babesia, which Lyme. That's amazing. That, think about that five yeah. years ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's well, you know, it's really cool to me too is, and I love that it comes around this. I just, I'm so proud of Rich. And mm -hmm. I, I think that a lot of people probably don't stand up and say, Rich, I'm proud of you because I remember 16 point differential diagnosis. I studied, studied with him, know him and his wife, Lee, very, very well, love them to death. But it was like, number 16 is always like some sort of psychiatric, blah, 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 blah. As of, of like the first winter of COVID, it was in capital letters, trauma. Yeah, and yeah. trauma is real oh, or yeah. perceived threat. It doesn't oh, have yeah. to happen. You could even just feel it might happen and you can be traumatized. But the definition of trauma is like, you know, varied and we all want to work on it. But one of the things I think is so important is the like saying, having the gurus of this field say, when you start to focus on what you want and getting better, you'll get better. And if you focus on what you don't want and do, do, do the research that your provider should be doing for you, then you're going to just go down the rabbit hole and get stuck. And one of the things that's like just that's so, so interesting is how it's not necessarily that you want to be sick, but it's that you're the one thing I think that for the biggest trauma I think people have is they they feel their body betrayed them mm -hmm. Yeah, when they're sick. True. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I understand there's unique in situations where I might, I'm not trying to say that some trauma didn't happen to you, but the general population of people with chronic illness feel their bodies are betraying them. And I can unequivocally 100% scientifically tell you that's bullshit. Your body is 100% of the time doing the very best it can in this moment to keep you safe. Yes. But the thing is, what safety to your nervous system is and what the rest of your body feels like and how strong your body is in a moment to help you change it may not be what you want in your mind, but, but there is no scientific evidence that your body ever does not show up 100% for you. Now your mind and your emotion, you may choose to not show up hundred percent for yourself, but your physiology is always doing it. And one of the things that I think is so inspiring is you have a choice there. And so I want to tell you one little quick thing that just blew my mind. And then I would love to leave everyone with a quick little exercise that's much more simple than all the things we've talked about that can get you in that space. And I was at a Joe Dispenza event doing, you know, it's a meditation event and they were studying what happens in the blood cells of people with who are not meditators and those who are novice and advanced meditators and advanced meditators were get this they meditated regularly for 6 months so a handful of times a week for that's not really that hard no so but whether you did a 7 day retreat or you were an experienced meditator of doing this for more than 6 months if they took your blood and then they exposed it to the spike protein we've been talking about in a pseudo virus for covid it prevented it from going in the cell Wow. And if you had oh, done it for six impressive. months rather than one week, you were a little better at it. But in as little as a week, wow. you can literally change your physiology to the point where your cells are more robustly impervious and immune to being attacked by viruses. Wow. And what was, and, and they, it was crazy. It's just so crazy. So one of the things I, I say to people is sometimes it's really hard when you have Lyme disease or long haul COVID or Bartonella to 
feel like you can get better or to get out of the headspace of just I'm suffering all day. Yeah. So I heard a really cool exercise from uh, Dr. Ben Hardy and Dan Sullivan that they teach in business courses, but it's about gratitude. And what's really crazy is it, this: it, if you do this for three or four days, it will change your life. And you basically at the end of the day, you give yourself three to four minutes. You are not allowed to spend any more time on this because we're too busy focusing on how crappy we feel. <laughs> but is <laughs> write down three wins from today on a piece of paper, something or or like a remarkable, but not an iPad. You really want to have something of this. And you know, you want to feel the feedback. But and and if you're like so sick that you don't have any type of um, you know, win for the day, you look at three bad things that happen, you figure out what lessons you're going to learn from those. And then you write them down. And then the cool part is then you write down three wins you'll have tomorrow. Which is so you're going to pre plan what's going to go well for you tomorrow. And you just make it up because if you don't believe in it, don't worry, just do it anyway. And so, because what happens then is a lot of times when we say how, to, how something's going to go well, our conscious mind says no because it hasn't gone well. And then our heart just like ah, shuts off. So, what we want to do is we do this before bed so that then we, when we go to sleep and our conscious mind dissociates from our body then our subconscious can start to channel in all this beautiful God or universal energy with these new ideas. And that's our super conscious. And we wake up tomorrow and what you're going to do is you're just going to read all six of those, takes you 15 seconds and that's it. And now just do this for two or three days because what you'll find is that by day three or four, you're going to have so many wins that you noticed in your days that you never noticed before that you're not going to be able to only keep it to three. And then you're going to start really planning your day tomorrow because it really happens. And what's really cool is in, in three or four days, you will accidentally become grateful because you'll be like, oh my God, there's so many things happening that are good. Oh, wait, we just tricked ourselves into actually feeling gratitude. So now gratitude has been proven to increase heart rate variability and improve yes. immune function, Absolutely. which does all the things we talked about today. And now the, the super crazy thing is everybody who just said, I can't do this because I'm, in, I'm an insomniac you now have accidentally, just by doing six wins every day, put yourself in a place of gratitude, which now creates a way to get a little bit more every day out of that stuck phase, that hopeless frozen state, and into a little gratitude, which is parasympathetic, but the parasympathetic that lets you sleep. Now you start to sleep and you get even better benefits. You get more energy. And oh, by the way, when we sleep, that's about 90% of our brain detoxification. So you can stop taking all your brain detox pills until you can sleep. Yep. We believe that, Tom. We absolutely love that exercise. We have other ones just like it. Um, and I I believe in them wholeheartedly. It's it's something I hope everyone listening to really takes seriously. Coming down into a parasympathetic state or a calmness. A breath belief, work. breath work. Oh, very good. You know, that is the beginning yeah. of allowing us to start stimulating the immune system differently. So, and it doesn't matter that there's a, there was a quick question somebody sent me, and I think it's a good wrap up for the part that I threw up is it doesn't matter what you're doing. And as long as you get yourself to the place of starting to feel a little bit more gratitude every day. So Joe Dispenza does all kinds of different meditations. There's a gazillion meditation people, but his primary work grows out of increasing heart rate variability by getting into your heart and lo loving and connecting with all whatever mm -hmm. that word means to you. So it is literally about coming whatever. So breath work I love because simple coherence, right? Simple. Breathe, feel breathing. Oh, I'm going to breathe into my chest. Now I'm going to breathe into the center of my chest and I'm going to think about someone or something I love. Instant improved heart rate variability and immune function. So it doesn't matter the type, as long as you allow love to come into your heart, that protective meditative process that we talked about where they've studied it will work. I agree. That's very I agree. Cool. Very nice. Thank you, Annie, for recording this for us. I know that I see people on here. We're going to say goodbye to you, folks that are all listening right now. Know, right? <laughs> Bye, Tom. Bye. Have fun on Sunday skiing. Yeah. Yeah. I'll see y'all guys out in the mountain. <laughs> I know, seriously. Absolutely.
We're looking forward to seeing you live, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. Next yeah. time. Let's do this again really soon. And anybody who has been listening, if you have specific questions, please send them in through is yeah. that to just, Rising Health? Yeah, you can just send them to info at risinghealthspecialty.com and we'll filter through them. Um, and also we'll be sending out the recording of this. If you missed the first few minutes or anything, as soon as it's um, processed, we'll send it out in an email blast and put it on our Facebook as well. And we'll okay. certainly uh, share it with Dr. Moorcroft also. Yes. So we'll stay in good connection with you. We're so Absolutely. glad you're here with us tonight. Thanks, yep. Tom. Thank you. Yeah, it's an honor. Thank you all for having me here. It's, a, it's always a pleasure to talk about this wonderful stuff and inspiring yeah. hope. Yes, it is. Exactly. It is. That's what we want to do. Right. Thanks again. We'll see you from Connecticut. We'll see you. <laughs> <laughs>